Hello there future ACCs, this is Vishnu Vijay, a proud film drama and your lecturer for the Advanced Performance Management paper. So folks, in this session, we will be practicing a question, a past paper question within the CBE environment. Okay folks, sounds interesting, isn't it? So we will learn as to how to tackle this particular question and what is the efficient and effective way to structure your answer to get the maximum marks available as well. Okay folks, keep this in mind. Now, before we deep dive in, don't forget to click on the subscribe button as well as the bell icon so that you can get notified for more informative content as well. Okay, folks. Now, when we talk about the APM exam, we what exactly is the approach to tackle the question there? It's kind of as to what the same approach would be if it were any other ECC papers as well. Isn't it? Read the requirement, read the scenario, and plan and structure your answer. However, one of the most common difficulties that a student faces within the APM exam is to know as to how exactly can you plan and structure your answer or what exactly was the requirement all about etc because it, it is a bit tricky isn't it so that is basically what we will be discussing okay folks as you can see here i have a question from one of the past papers in march june 2021 and this particular organization is known as gadden co isn't it so we will be talking about as to what gadden co is all about so what is the first thing that you should do within the CBE environment here? The first exam technique that you can use here, you can just click on the requirements. I'm just going to copy paste all of these. These are all the basic requirements, isn't it? Do we have anything more? No, not really, isn't it? So I'm just going to control C it and then control V it on my word processor. As simple as that. Okay, folks, why exactly are we doing this? This is all that. Uh, we don't have, we don't need this particular window anymore, isn't it? So that's basically it. And of course, now what we do is we just, you know, structure a little bit. There we go. We have A and then B and then C as well. Let's read through each one of these and understand as to what this question is all about, shall we? It is now 1st September 2000X5. Okay, that's understandable. Using the 2000X4 G score, advise the CEO whether Gadden is at risk of corporate failure and evaluate the usefulness of using uh, quantitative models such as G-score to predict corporate failure. Okay, have we learned of a model known as the G-score model? I'm not sure, isn't it? So because we've learned about an A-score model as well as a Z-score model as well. However, was there a G-score model? No, not really, isn't it? So what is this G-score model? Well, that's something that we will understand when we read the scenario, okay, folks. However, we have understood as to what the requirement actually is, isn't it? What is the requirement? We only have to do one thing here, isn't it? No, not really. Okay, so we have to do two things here. Okay, the first thing is to advise the CEO whether Gadden is at the risk of corporate failure. And then uh, that's basically that, like the conclusion that we provide for this particular requirement. And then we have to evaluate the usefulness of using the quantitative models, that is the G-score model, as simple as that. Okay, folks. And why exactly are we doing this? Basically to predict the corporate failure as to whether this particular organization is at risk of corporate failure or not, isn't it? That's basically it. So we have to conduct that, or conduct that evaluation using the G-score model and provide a conclusion to the CEO as well, isn't it? So remember that. And this is for 10 marks. Okay, folks, so remember that. And of course, since this is a quantitative model, we can definitely expect some calculations here as well, isn't it? What else? Advise the CEO why liquidity indicators are important in assessing the likelihood of corporate failure at Gadden and assess whether the current liquidity of the business indicates a corporate failure is likely. Okay, so that's it for eight marks. What do we have to do here? We have to take a look at the liquidity indicators, isn't it? And then interpret them. That's basically the idea here. Okay, folks. And of course, in order to do this, what do we have to use? We have to use the scenario information to get more points. Okay, folks, remember that. And what else? Assuming that Gadden is at risk of corporate failure, evaluate the risk which have led to the company finding itself in, it, in this position. So why exactly is the organization at the risk of corporate failure? That's basically something that we have to point out as well. And this is for seven marks. Okay. So I can understand the content of these requirements. However, 
How is it worth this much marks? That's a question that you all might have as of now, isn't it? How can we write this particular content for 10 marks, 8 marks and 7 marks? Well, the answer is simple. Use scenario information and use your knowledge. Well, that's kind of seems kind of obvious, isn't it? However, let me demonstrate as to how we can do that. But before that, we will have to read through the scenario, isn't it? And understand as to what are all the relevant information from the scenario itself. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at that. I'm just going to close this and open the company information first of all. And what exactly is the information all about? Let's take a look. Gadden has successfully operated a chain of 90 gymnasiums in Jayland for many years. Okay. The founder of the business retired during 2003 due to ill health. Understandable. His daughter, who had graduated from Jayland School of Business in the same year, took over from him as Gadden's CEO. As a student, the new CEO had worked as an intern in neighboring Wieland. She knew that many citizens, they have unhealthy lifestyles. Okay, that's understandable. And participation in sport and physical exercise is very much lower than in Jayland. Okay. As there were relatively few gymnasiums in Wieland, the CEO believed that there was a great opportunity to expand the Garden brand there. Okay, so that's basically as to what the situation is, isn't it? So we have an organization and we have an inexperienced CEO as well, isn't it? So the leader itself is kind of inexperienced. So will he be capable enough to lead that organization? I don't necessarily think so, isn't it? So that's basically one of the issues that we may have in this particular scenario. And of course, they're planning on expanding. However, do they have the sufficient level of assets and uh, all the uh, let's say cash balances or financial resources to do that? That's yet again another question that we have to understand as well, isn't it? Okay, so that's just the background information. Let's read through the rest of it as well. Let's talk about expansion to VLAN now, shall we? Hey, wait, wait. It seems that most of you who are watching this video have not subscribed to our channel. You would miss the new videos and the updates. Subscribe now and press the bell icon. The CEO told the members of the board to draw up an ambitious plan to open a chain of 60 new gymnasiums in VLAN. Okay. Until then, Gadden's strategy had remained unchanged for a long time and the business opened an average of one new gymnasium each year. Okay. Most of the board members had little experience of evaluating the strategic change on the scale that was, that, uh, which, it, which was now being proposed and had relied on former CEO to guide them on strategic matters. Okay, so we have inexperienced management within this organization as well, isn't it? So are they going in the di right direction? What do you think? No, not really, isn't it? So that's something that we can point out in our answer as well. And what else? At a board meeting, Gadden's finance director expressed concerns about the amount of debt which would be required to fund the expansion and the high level of risk involved in operating overseas for the first time on such a large scale. Okay, so it is a risky strategy, isn't it? Expanding is currently a risky strategy for this particular organization. If it fails, then the organization will definitely fail as well, isn't it? So that's basically uh, the idea here. I'm just gonna highlight this particular point, this high level of risk. Shortly after the board meeting, he resigned from the board and took a job in the competitor organization. Okay, understandable. In addition, a number of other board members discussed privately that expansion was unlikely to succeed in a nation as unhealthy as Wieland, but did not openly voice their opposition to the CEO's plan, which is a bad move, isn't it? That should not have happened, isn't it? Because if the manager feels that this particular strategy is risky, then there should have been, should have been an open discussion with that particular aspect with the CEO itself. What else? In the absence of a finance director, the CEO did much of the financial evaluation expansion herself. Okay. She assumed that each new gymnasium would generate the same average annual revenue as those in Jalen of $432,000. Okay, that's understandable. What else? On the same basis, fixed staff and operating costs would be $343,000. 
as the capital assets of $400,000 need to be set up for each gymnasium would be depreciated over 25 years, she calculated the annual profit from each gymnasium would be around $73,000 and the payback period on the cash flows of the project would be 4.5 years. Okay. But is this calculation valid? I mean, this particular individual is a bit inexperienced, isn't it? So, what are we missing out on anything? Is it appropriate to assume that there would be an average revenue of uh, 432,000, the same as what they have in Jalen? No, no, really, isn't it? There could be differences between regions, isn't it? Uh, one, uh, currently we operate in the Jalen region, whereas we're planning to expand to Wheeland, isn't it? However, Due to the difference in lifestyles and various other factors, various other market conditions, there is a possibility that the revenue might be either lower or higher as well. As it depends. So that's something that this particular individual has not considered. We can point that out. And what else? Operating cost. Well, since the uh, since they haven't necessarily considered anything in relation to the revenue, I hardly think that they would uh, they would have put much thought to the uh, rest of the costs as well. Okay, folks. So what else? In total. 24 million was required to finance the expansion, but the banks was only willing to give Gadden a loan of 12 million dollars. Okay, convinced that her plan would would be a success, the CEO persuaded a wealthy family friend to lend Gadden an additional 12 million dollars. Okay, both loans were for 25 years, and both had an annual floating interest rate of 5%. So these are all financial data which, which could come in handy, especially when we're calculating some ratios or so, isn't it? So keep this in mind. And what else? At the beginning of 2000X4, Gadden opened the planned 60 new gymnasiums in VLED. Okay, that's understandable. Though performance was better than uh, some had expected, the number of customers at each gymnasium was much lower than for a similar gymnasium in JLED. Okay. And customers were unwilling to pay such high membership prices. So, they will be considered the financial aspect, isn't it? Not the known financial uh, information. That's something that we can point out maybe, isn't it? What else? At the end of July 2005, the Central Bank of Zealand raised interest rates. Okay. And the rate of, and remember guys, the loan that we have acquired is based on floating interest rates, isn't it? So if the market rates, market interest rates increases, then this particular interest rate will also increase as well. Okay, folks. So uh, the plan doesn't necessarily work out isn't it? because the debt is now a bit more. The interest charge would be a bit more as well. And what exactly is the situation? Let's take a look. The rate of interest at, on Gadden's loans has increased to 7% from 5%. Okay, that's a significant increase of 2%, which is definitely, uh, you know, a bit risky, isn't it? So what else? It is now 1st September 2005 and Gadden has already missed the two, July 2005 and August 2005 installments on both of its loan payments in order to afford to pay creditors and staff wages. Okay, so definitely there are a lot of things going wrong within this particular organization, isn't it? Due to bad leadership and various other factors as well, isn't it? So that is something that we can point out. Now I'm just going to close this for now and open up the next aspect that is the G-score model. So what is the G-score model all about? Let's take a look at that. The CEO has contacted you as a performance management consultant. Well, congratulations, guys. In this particular question, you are a performance management consultant. To advise her on Gadden's deteriorating financial position and whether the business is at risk of corporate failure. You have decided to calculate G-score for Gadden to help with your work. Okay. So the G-score, it could be kind of similar to what we've learned in Z-score as well, isn't it? So let's take a look at that. So what is the G-score model that has been provided over here? Let's talk about it. The G-score is a quantitative model for predicting corporate failure for companies listed in JLint. Okay. It was created by a group of academics at the JSB, which is the JLIN School of Business, isn't it? That's basically it. It is based on the statistical correlation between a company's key financial ratios and the success or failure of the company within two years of the sample data. So this is exactly, I would say, uh, a duplicate form of the Z-score model itself, isn't it? That's basically it. It is derived from statistical analysis of the published accounts of all companies 
on the small JLEN stock exchange. Okay, that's understandable as well. Okay, folks, so the weighted average figures provided here is based on the uh, average figure within the JLEN stock exchange, isn't it? So keep this in mind. Now, let's take a look at how this is calculated now, shall we? The G-score is calculated by applying the following weighting, weighting factors to four key financial ratios and adding these weighted elements together. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So we have G1, G2, G3 and G4. What are these? G1 stands for current assets by total assets. And then we have G2, which is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and amortization, which is EBITDA, isn't it? So we uh, divide EBITDA with the total assets and then there is revenue divided by total assets and then total assets divided by non-current liabilities as well. Okay, folks, so using these ratio, we determine a score. How do we interpret it? Let's take a look at that, shall we? Companies with the G-score of less than 4 are in danger of corporate failure. Okay, that's understandable. What else? Whereas companies with the score of 6 or more are not in danger or of failure. So basically, 4 to 6 is basically the gray area, isn't it? So that's basically something that we have to keep in mind. Those companies with a score of, uh, of between 4 and 6 need further analysis to determine whether, whether they are at the risk of corporate failure, as simple as that. And extracts from Jade and Co's 2000X3 and 2000X4 accounts are given in the appendix. Okay, folks, so we have appendix one over here and the financial data as well, isn't it? So using these financial data, we will of course have to calculate the G-score and then evaluate it, isn't it? That's basically a part of the first requirement itself. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. So we have quite a few information provided to us. We have the extract from the statement of financial position, the assets and liabilities. And we also have the statement of profit and loss as well, isn't it? As well as the uh, one particular statement from the cash flow statement as well, which is basically the free cash flow after capital expenditure, which is a significant decrease. Okay, that's understandable as well. So using this data, what all things do we have to do? We have to uh, evaluate, sorry, we have to advise the CEO whether Gadden is at risk of corporate failure and evaluate the usefulness of that particular model. Okay, folks, we have to evaluate the usefulness of the model itself. So first of all, what we have to do is we will have to calculate the ratio, okay, sorry, the calculate the G-score and then interpret it. And then we provide the advantages and disadvantages. The pros and cons of the uh, this particular model will also be communicated. It's basically the same as what we've learned for the Z-score model as well, isn't it? So remember that. And then we have the next requirement that is, advise the CEO why uh, liquidity indicators are important in assessing the risk of corporate failure. So we can use a lot of scenario information that we uh, discussed in this particular requirement, okay folks, in relation to the debts, the increase in interest change, etc. Okay folks, so all these things are, uh, can be considered to score these eight marks. And finally, assuming that Gadden is at high risk of corporate failure, evaluate factors which have led to the company finding itself in that position. So we have to also take a look at as to what are the factors within this particular uh, scenario that has led to its failure. What are all the factors? Poor leadership of the CEO, that's one thing. And unwillingness of the management to communicate their opinions, etc. That's another thing. And of course, uh, unforeseen factors such as uh, the uh, or unexpected or uncontrollable factors such as increases in interest, interest rates, etc. A lot of things can be communicated here, isn't it? So this is for seven marks. So. After reading the scenario, we now have the content to write our answer, isn't it? So use this content and then structure your answer, okay, folks? That is how you can tackle this particular question. So let me demonstrate as to what a demo answer or what an ideal answer should look like, shall we? So folks, let's take a look at a sample answer and understand how it should be structured, shall we? So in order to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up the response option right here and I've already input it my sample answer now there are a few exam techniques that you can use over here okay folks so first of all what you can do is you can uh, convert this particular requirement into a heading okay so how exactly is that done you may ask isn't it so i'm just going to remove this particular aspect over here we won't be needing this and then i'm just going to divide this particular requirement into two first one was basically to advise the ceo whether Gadden is at risk of 
corporate failure, isn't it? And the second aspect to this requirement is the evaluation of usefulness of the uh, quantitative models. So I'm just going to clear all of these and this as well. And now I can just convert this into a heading. Okay, folks, I'm just going to convert it into the risk of for corporate failure for Gaden. As simple as that. So this would be my first heading. And my second heading would be evaluation of the usefulness of quantitative models or in this case I can just say of g-score model isn't it g-score model there we go so I'm just gonna copy paste this from here to right over here there we go so I've structured my answer using headings and subheading. Why am I doing this? This is so that I can present my answer in a wonderful manner to, to the examiner. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And another aspect that you have to understand here is that what exactly should we do in requirement A? We can just, uh, you know, provide our answer with on the basis of the advantages and disadvantages of G-score that but that's basically the second aspect to it but the first aspect is basically to calculate the G-score model isn't it so in order to do that what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some calculations based on the uh, criteria that has been stated over here I just have to calculate all the G1, G2, G3 and G4 and then calculate the G-score model using these weighted average numbers isn't it so that's basically as to what I have to do okay so where should I do this now I'm going to do this calculation in obviously the spreadsheet, isn't it? That's basically why we have a spreadsheet, isn't it? So I'm just going to uh, open up a spreadsheet over here and I've already done the calculations. There we go. But one thing that you have to keep in mind is that another, I would say, presentation related aspects that you can do here is to provide a statement that says, please refer to the spreadsheet for the calculation of G-score. Okay, folks, so I'm just providing a reference in the word processor for the particular calculations. That's basically it. And if the examiner goes to the particular spreadsheet, you, they can see that there is a calculation for G-score. I'm just gonna provide a numbering to it. There, there we go, that's for A. Now, how exactly is this calculated? We have some financial data available here and we also have the method to calculate each of these items provided within the particular uh, scenario itself, isn't it? So I'm just going to apply that. That's basically it. How do you calculate G1? It's basically current assets divided by total assets. Okay, folks, what is the current assets? Do we have that? Yes, we do. We have to just calculate it over here. We have it 2780 and 3370 in the prior year. However, we don't need the prior year figure, isn't it? We just need the current year figure over here. And then uh, I divide it using the total assets, that is 42,670. Have I done that? Yes, I have. Okay, folks, and I've received an answer that states 0 0.07, isn't it? That's basically my G1. What about G2? I've yet again provided the calculation. Okay, folks, what you have to understand here is that you don't necessarily have to specifically state out the formula or anything in the spreadsheet itself. Okay, folks, the examiner can just click on your answer and see the uh, method of calculation by looking at the formula bar, isn't it? That's basically it. Okay, folks, so you don't have to separately showcase as to how you calculated this. Just have to, you know, type in the formula within the cells. That's basically all you have to keep in mind. Now, then you have G2. And how do you calculate that? That's basically, uh, let's just take a look at it over here. Yeah, EBITDA divided by total assets, isn't it? The earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization divided by total assets. That's basically as to what this particular figure is. And then uh, I have the financial information over here. And do we have uh, an earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization provided to us? We have operating expenses and operating profit, isn't it? Okay, so we know that the operating profit is basically the profit before interest and tax, isn't it? What about depreciation and amortization then? 
Well, we have a statement stating here that operating profit in 2000X4 is after charging 2 million in depreciation and amortization. Okay, so the depreciation and amortization amount is 2 million. So what do we have to do? We just have to add back this 2 million to 1790,000, isn't it? So these figures are given in thousands, okay, folks? So keep this in mind. That's a really important point to remember. And we just have to add back the 2000. That's basically it, okay, folks? That is exactly what I've done here, okay, folks? So negative 1790 plus 2000, okay, folks? So in other words, 2 million uh, is added to 1.79 million. And I divide the, uh, the entire amount by the total assets, that is 42,670. And I'll get 0 0.00, well, this is basically up until two decimal places, but if we expand on it, it'll become to 0 0.005 or so. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, moving on to G3, how is it calculated? Revenue divided by total assets. That's kind of an easy figure, isn't it? Because we already have the revenue and total assets provided to us. Revenue is 51,840. And of course, the total assets is right over here. Okay, books 42, 670. That's basically it. Is that the amount? Yes, it is. Isn't it? As simple as that. Moving on to the next aspect, G4. What is G4? Total assets divided by known current liability, isn't it? So we have the total asset of uh, 42, 670. And what exactly is the known current liabilities? Let's take a look at that, shall we? We have the liabilities over here. The known current liabilities are 24,100, isn't it? So we are going to take the 24,000 here, as simple as that. This is how you calculate the G4 amount as well. And how do you calculate the G score anyway? Well, that's basically provided here, isn't it? So I just have to multiply G1 with 3 and G2 with 4, G3 with 1.5 and uh, G4 with 1.2 and add all of these amounts. Okay, folks, this is exactly the equation that has been provided here. And I've just linked the numbers to the uh, cells that have provided my answer in. That's basically all I had to do. And I'll get a total score of 4.17, isn't it? So now what do I have to do? I can't just calculate it and move on to the next aspect of the requirement, isn't it? I have to conclude on it. What exactly does this score represent? That will obtain marks within your exam as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. So, what does this particular score represent? We know that any and every score below four means that the organization is at risk of corporate failure, isn't it? And of course, any and ever, every score above six is the safe zone. So, between four and six is basically the gray area. However, we can also mention that since this particular score is close to four, it is at a risk of corporate failures. And that's something that we can uh, mention as well. Okay, folks, I've provided my answer over here. Let's read about it, shall we? Gaddon's G score lies in the interval between four and six, where further analysis is needed to evaluate the probability of corporate failure. The G score is, however, close to four, at which point Gaddon would be in danger of corporate failure. As simple as that. I'll get one mark over here, one mark each for the calculation of G1, G2, G3, and G4, and that will get me a total of five marks, isn't it? Now, all that is left to do is to score the rest of the five marks available, isn't it? And that can be done by explaining the advantages and disadvantages of the quantitative model, just like what we've learned through the syllabus. Okay, folks, that's basically it. However, we can't just simply state the knowledge just like that. We have to link it to the scenario information as well, isn't it? And we have quite a few amount of scenario information which we can use as well. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at each of these, shall we? First of all, we have the advantages stated over here. So let's read through it, shall we? The calculation of the G-score is relatively straightforward and uses information which is readily available in the guidance published accounts. This allows benchmarking against different organizations in the same industry and evaluation of changes in G-score over time. So that's basically a straightforward advantage, isn't it? A simple point. We just basically stating that we can calculate the particular amount using readily available information and we can use this information and compare it with the best in class as well. Okay, we can also conduct bench uh, benchmarking activities uh, using this particular model as well. That's one of the advantages and I've stated that and I'll get one mark for stating it. And what else? The G-score is based on statistical correlation between financial ratios and past company failures. 
It is therefore an objective calculation which does not rely on individual judgment and may be tailored to make it more relevant for organizations operating in different industries or countries. Okay, so what's the idea here? We're just basically stating the fact that since it is based on uh, statistical financial ratios, it's a bit more reliable or it does not involve any sort of judgment to it, isn't it? So that's basically it. Okay, because that's basically the idea stated over here. And I'll get one mark for stating that. And then we move on to some of the drawbacks as well. Okay, so two marks have been scored for advantages and we have three marks to score the full 10 marks, isn't it? So how do you score the rest of the three marks? By stating these points. Okay, folks, let's take a look at each of them. The G-score is backwards looking and based on historical financial data for the company. This historical information may not be relevant for future performance. So this particular thing is a generic disadvantage that we have learned regarding the G-score model, isn't it? However, we're not stopping here, okay folks? We have to relate this generic knowledge that we've stated to the scenario. Okay folks, let's, let's talk about that, shall we? The financial data used in the calculation is from the company's published accounts for the year to June 2004, isn't it? And what is, what is the current year? 2005, isn't it? That's what was stated within the requirement itself, isn't it? So keep this in mind. And so it is already over a year out of date. Okay, so we've calculated this G-score, yes. However, it's out of date, isn't it? Why exactly do I see that? Because after the year end of 2004, there, are a lot, there have been a lot of things that has occurred, isn't it? There was an increase in the interest rates. There was a risky strategy has is about to fail. That's something that's, that should be considered as well. So all these factors can either improve the score or deteriorate it to a significant extent as well. Okay, folks, so there are a few factors more that we still have to consider before concluding upon the G-score. That's all what we're saying here. Okay, folks, the financial data used in the calculation, yeah. Uh, events after the date of these accounts, such as the increase in interest rates by the central bank of JLN, could have caused the guidance financial situation to have improved or deteriorated. Okay, folks, it, it, it is a possibility that it could have been improved due to certain other factors, which May not, may not have been provided within the scenario as well, isn't it? So we're just uh, providing that particular factor into consideration here. Okay, folks, and what else? By September 2005, Gadden had already defaulted on payment uh, of its debt to the bank. The continuing support or otherwise of the bank is likely to be clearer indicator of corporate failure than is the G-score calculator of using the historical financial data. That's basically it. Okay, but we're just stating that the since the particular G-score model is based on historical financial data, can we rely on it? Okay, because there is a certain limit to the level of reliance that we can place on it. Okay, because that's all what we're trying to say here. And of course, we've used too much information here. However, this is not necessarily necessary in the exam. You just have to relate one of the scenario information or a few points from the scenario information in this particular area. Okay, folks, uh, it changes in the floating interest rate as well as the defaults and payments as well as the uh, various other aspects within this particular point itself, isn't it? However, this can make the particular, uh, you know, point a bit too explanatory. However, this much explanation is not expected from you under exam conditions. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. This is just to give you an idea. Now, moving on to the next aspects. Also, the G-score only predicts whether corporate failure is likely to occur in the next two years. That's basically a common thing that we've learned when we learned, talked about the Z-score model, isn't it? It is, it basically states the particular uh, as to whether the organization would fail in the next two years or so, isn't it? And of course, uh, one of which has already elapsed since we've taken the data of 2004, we, uh, we are basically, uh, you know, one year uh, a bit too late, isn't it? That's basically what has been highlighted here. And of course, it therefore is able to predict corporate failure for only a relatively short amount of time. Okay, that's basically a common disadvantage specific to this situation, isn't it? So that's basically something that I pointed out as well. And what else? The published accounts of companies approaching corporate failure may be more subject to manipulation and creative accounting than other companies. This may limit the usefulness of calculating the G-score Though there is no evidence of this happening at Gadden. Okay, so we're just stating a possibility now. Okay, folks, what exactly is the possibility that we're stating here? We're stating the possibility that Gadden Co's financial statements would have been a bit manipulated here and there since we are, you know, 
since there are a lot of indicators of corporate failure. And of course, the management would be pressured to overstate the results in front of their investors and all uh, all the individuals who are dependent upon the organization, isn't it? So that's basically a possibility that we have stated as well. And since the G-score is calculated using the uh, accounting financial figures, there is definitely a possibility that this might be misstated, isn't it? So that's basically the idea conveyed over here. And yeah, that's basically three points, isn't it? So two points for the advantages and three points for the drawback and that will get me a total of five marks for making relevant points. So if you noted this particular aspect, we haven't just stated the generic knowledge that we've learned throughout our syllabus. We've related that particular knowledge to various information that has been provided within the scenario itself, isn't it? So that is how you make relevant points in the exam. Okay, folks, try to relate each and every point to the scenario information that has been provided. So that's basically how you score the 10 marks for the first requirement. Moving on to the next aspect, that is advice on the CEO why liquidity indicators are important in assessing the likelihood of corporate failure at Gadden and assess whether liquidity of the business indicates corporate fa failure is likely. Okay, so I would say that we can, we don't necessarily have to, you know, we can split it into two sub requirements, I would say. one talks about the importance of liquidity indicators in assessing the likelihood of corporate failure, which is like a generic uh, question that has been asked from the examiner's side. And finally, we have to assess whether the current liquidity of the business indicates as to whether Gad & Co will liquidate or not. That's basically it. Okay, folks, so two aspects to it. I can just uh, rephrase this particular requirement to a heading. Okay, folks, so let me just do that. I could just say importance of liquidity indicators as the first one. And of course, yeah, this particular heading is enough itself, isn't it? So I'm just gonna delete this, there we go. And bolt it a little bit, as simple as that. <clears throat> now, let's read through the particular uh, answer provided here, shall we? Now, one thing that you have to understand here is that since we are talking about liquidity related aspects, we may have to calculate liquidity ratios as well, isn't it? So this is exactly what I've done over the spreadsheet as well. Okay, folks. So yet again, I'm just going to provide a reference within the word processor itself. So uh, I'm just going to say, please refer to the spreadsheet for calculations of the liquidity ratios. As simple as that. Okay, folks, a simple sentence that can help the examiners understand that we have provided our calculation within the spreadsheet itself, isn't it? As simple as that. Now, let's read through it, shall we? As companies approach corporate failure, their published accounts are more likely to be manipulated or have changes in accounting policies which affect profit. Liquidity indicators are important and more reliable than profit-based indicators because cash is much harder to manipulate in published accounts than profit, which can subject, which contain subjective judgments and estimates. So when it comes to the profit calculation, we do have some accounting estimates being used to calculate it, isn't it? Such as depreciation, amortization, etc. All these are judgmental figures, isn't it? However, when it comes to cash, there's no uh, manipulation. The, the potential to manipulate the cash figures within the financial statements is a bit low. Okay, folks, there are possibilities. There are possibilities. Yes, definitely. However, it is low. Okay, folks, that is what has been stated here. So if you think about it, the cash-based of ratios would be a bit more reliable than the profit based ratios, isn't it? So that's basically what has been highlighted here. I'll get one mark for stating that. And what else? You can, of course, if you want, you can use a bit more simple language to state this particular point as well. Okay, folks, use concise yet comprehensive statements in your answer. And of course, I provided the calculations, uh, you know, reference for the calculation. And then uh, I've commented on it within the spreadsheet itself. Okay, because I'm not going to comment on or provide my theoretical sentences and all the other things within the uh, spreadsheet. I'll do that within the uh, word processor itself, isn't it? So keep this in mind. Now, 
The company's cash position has deteriorated significantly by 89% between 2003 and 2007. How did I get that particular amount? Well, basically, this is basically the difference of the cash flow after capital expenditure right over here. Okay, folks, so this is basically the idea. And what else? To the point in September 2005 where it has had to default on loan payments in order to pay staff and trade payables. This deterioration is due to the cash required for the setting up of 16 new gymnasiums in VLAN and also due to the operating losses the company has suffered as a result of lower than anticipating customer number there. So when we determine or when we explain a particular ratio increase and decrease, we not only really have to point that increase and decrease factor alone, but we have to explain why this has happened as well. And we will definitely have the information in relation to why this has happened as well. Okay, folks, so use that information and then present your answer like that. Okay, folks, don't just say this particular ratio has increased, the other has decreased. Also mention as to why that has happened within the organization as well. Okay, folks, that is what the examiner is looking for in your answer. Moving on, the current ratio has also deteriorated significantly by 89%. Okay, sorry, uh, this is not the decrease ratio, I would say, uh, if you look at the spreadsheet, the current ratio has decreased from 3.85 to 1.88, isn't it? So that's definitely a significant decrease and we, we will have to point out that, point that particular factor out in the answer itself. And what else? This means Gadden is less able to pay its current liabilities as they fall due. Okay, so that's basically as to what it means, isn't it? So we're just explaining as to what the current ratio means here. And of course, yeah, I'm also supporting this particular factor by stating that this has been indicated as they as they have defaulted the payment for July 2005 and August 2005, isn't it? So this is basically an indication that uh, the organization's performance is in line with the ratios that we've calculated. And of course, we're just stating that particular, we're just proving that particular point here. That's basically it. And I'll get another one mark for that. What else? Another important indicator of liquidity to assess whether Gadden is at risk of corporate failure is its interest cover ratio, okay? That is the relationship between operating cash flows of the business and its interest payments. Okay, so what are we doing here? We're calculating the interest cover based on the operating cash flows, isn't it? So if that is the case, what we will have to do is we will have to separate the accounting estimates from the profit figure, isn't it? So we normally have learned that the interest cover ratio is calculated using operating profits divided by, which is basically profit before interest and tax divided by the interest rate, sorry, interest amount, isn't it? That's basically it. However, since we are taking a look at the cash flow related aspects, what should we do? We should also add back the depreciation and amortization and any other accounting estimate to this calculation as well. Okay, folks, this is exactly what I've done in my calculation over here. Okay, folks. So I've calculated the interest cover ratio right here, which is 0.18. And how did I do that? It's basically negative 1790 plus 2000, isn't it? Which is basically the profit before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization divided by the interest value that is 1200. This is how I've calculated the interest cover. And I didn't necessarily calculate it in the prior year because we don't have enough information available, isn't it? We don't have enough information regarding the profit before interest tax depreciation and amortization for the prior year, which is why we are not calculating that. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. And moving on back to the word processor. An interest cover below the range of, uh, below the range of or between two and five is a strong indicator of corporate failure. A common point, we've just mentioned that. Okay, folks. And of course, since the organization's interest cover is 0.18, it's definitely at the risk of corporate failure, isn't it? So that is yet again another factor that I've indicated. And what else? A much better predictor of corporate failure is the ratio of free cash flow to total non-current liabilities. Okay, that's kind of effective as well, isn't it? This is a new ratio that we are learning. And of course, what exactly does this ratio mean? Let's talk about that, shall we? In 2003, this was 18 to 1. Okay, so what exactly are we talking about here? We're talking about the 
free cash flows cash flows of the organization is compared to the non current liabilities of the organization to see if we can meet it or not that's basically it okay do we have the stuff it's kind of similar to the current ratio itself isn't it in current ratio we use the current assets as well as the current liabilities isn't it however when it comes to the free cash flows to non current liabilities we are just using a different approach that's basically we're taking a look at the cash flows total cash flows that the organization have and we divide it with the non current liabilities that they have as well okay folks and see understand the ratio now in the prior year this was a good amount isn't it this was uh, 38 is to 1 okay so definitely we did have the appropriate amount of cash in order to meet our non current liabilities however what about in the current year do we have that no not really isn't it that is what has been stated here okay folks so in the current year it's negative 0.13 So this is a significant decrease. Okay, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? Having a negative free free cash flow, Garden is already defaulting on its debt payments and breaching loan covenants with its lenders. Without the continuing support of lenders, Garden will be unable to avoid the corporate failure. Okay, folks, this is a really good indicator of the organization status as of now, isn't it? This is exactly what has been pointed out. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. So that's basically how you tackle this particular question. Now, regarding the marks available, I would see that uh, you will get one mark for this point, two over here, three, four, and five. And of course, if you look at the spreadsheet, you you've done three calculations, isn't it? So you'll get three marks over here as well. Okay, folks, keep this in mind. So that's how you score the eight marks available for requirement B. However, is the question over? No, not really, isn't it? We have one more requirement, so let's take a look at that, shall we? Assuming that Garden is at risk of corporate failure, evaluate the factors which have led to the company's finding itself in its position. Well, yet again, I'm just gonna convert this into a heading. Reasons for high risk of corporate failure at Garden. As simple as that. I don't need the rest of these sentences, so I'm just gonna clear this. There we go. and i'm just going to bold it to make it look a little nice that's basically it there we go now what exactly were the reasons let's talk about that shall we first of all there was a major project failure isn't it so that's basically something that we can point out so what have we written here the transition from a previously successful business to a failing one is often due to a major project or investment or acquisition which goes very wrong but that's just a generic point however let's relate it to garden shall we this appears to be the case in garden and the root cause of why this happened seems to stem from poor management and poor in uh, financial controls that's basically it okay we're just mentioning that the particular reason for failure could be due to the uh, a major failure in the project of a, of that particular organization okay folks so that's basically the idea here and i'll get one mark for stating that what else we also have management failings as well isn't it so what exactly is the idea here because we have noted that the ceo is not that experienced that's one thing and of course uh, the particular management also have little knowledge about all these things as well isn't it so we're just going to point that particular fact out the ceo seems to be relatively inexperienced furthermore the other board members appear to not have to the skills and experience to support her at least not in the formation of strategy there seems to have been little impetus in developing strategy in the past and the board relied on the ceo for strategic direction as well isn't it so they are a bit too dependent on the ceo and that doesn't necessarily showcase a good uh, impression for the management isn't it so that is exactly what we have stated over here okay folks one mark over that i'm of, of course i can further build up on that particular point as well how can i do that the ceo seems to have little commercial acumen in setting up gymnasium in a country where the citizens are not interested in sports or physical ex exercise okay folks so when we read the scenario it was mentioned that the particular uh, people within uh, wieland they have an unhealthy lifestyle isn't it however nowhere was it mentioned that this particular people is inter are interested in uh, conducting these uh, you know fitness programs or attending uh, gymnasiums etc isn't it that particular point is not mentioned anywhere so therefore is it necessarily a good approach to introduce this particular uh, new concept of gymnasiums into that particular uh, region 
doesn't necessarily seem that that much attractive, isn't it? Because we don't necessarily see much opportunity to it. However, the only information that we have is that they have an un un unhealthy lifestyle. Okay, folks, that's basically it. So we don't know as to whether we will have enough customers or enough, enough memberships to conduct the operations for the foreseeable future. So that's basically it. Okay, folks, we're just stating that due to the CEO's lack of commercial acumen, the particular organization is taking a very risky strategy. That's basically it. And what else? However, the other board members should have challenged the CEO strongly about this concern and the risk of the project. So it's the it's not the CEO alone that is alone uh, that is to blame in this particular situation, but there is also the management as well, isn't it? Why haven't they challenged the CEO regarding that particular strategy? That's yes, yet again a cause of concern, and that uh, that'll get me another one mark. And what else? To improve performance in the formation of strategy in the future. Garden needs to appoint board members who have the skill and experience to drive strategy formulation and willingness to challenge the CEO. So we're just providing a recommendation here, isn't it? So in the exam providing recommendation, your own professional judgment will also have value for the examiner. Okay, folks, so provide recommendations wherever possible as well. Okay, folks, so the recommendation here in this particular situation would be to appoint new board members who are willing to formulate a particular strategy which can cause the success of Garden. And of course, we should hire experienced and people with skills this time. Okay, because that's basically the idea here. And of course, they should also have the willingness to challenge the CEO if they find a particular strategy to, the, to be risky as well. Okay, folks, what else? And then there are there is the aspect of poor financial controls as well. And where, where do we or how did we get this particular idea? Well, basically, the director, the finance director of the organization has left the company soon after the expansion plan was brought up and he was apparently not replaced and the CEO undertook the financial evaluation of the project herself. As a result, possibly due to lack of skill or experience, some fundamental aspects of the future performance of new gymnasiums were not considered, resulting in operating losses, nor were the liquidity requirements of the project adequately considered as well. So the, this particular CEO, he, he has conducted a particular performance, sorry, financial evaluation. However, was that appropriate? Oh, no, not really. That's basically the, that's basically the point stated here. Okay, folks, the uh, consideration, the, he has not, he, she has not taken up any consideration regarding the market related aspects or uncertainties that could impact that particular plan or even the liquidity related aspects as well. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. And well, to prevent this recurring, Garden should develop clear performance criteria for the evaluation of new investments or projects. And the business must ensure that it has the staff with the necessary skills and experience to undertake investment appraisal and to be able to evaluate risk in the external environment. So what am I doing? I've identified an issue. I'm just recommending a course of action to it, isn't it? So since we don't have an appropriate level of experience set of finance professionals, what we have to do is we just have to hire more of them, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks. And how many marks have we scored up until now? Let's take a look. One, two, three, four, five, and six, isn't it? So one more mark is left. So we provide uh, information in relation to the changes in the external environment as well. That's another reason for the organization to fail as well, isn't it? So what exactly were the changes in the external environment? Gadden must ensure that it fully evaluates risk in the external environment when appraising new investments. For example, by using a pest analysis. Well, that's basically a method in which we can analyze the macroeconomic environment, isn't it? So we could have done that. It is unclear whether the rise of interest rate in Jaden would have been foreseen but this change in the external environment greatly compounded the liquidity problems caused by the overambitious expansion plans. Okay, so effectively, if you think about it, we know that the expansion plan was risky, but it was a bit over over ambitious, isn't it? What do I mean by that? Basically means that we're just dreaming of something that may not have been possible. Okay, folks, so that's basically as to what it means. Now, uh, of course, one of the most major contributions to the liquidity problems of the organization was the increase in interest rate from 5% to 7%, isn't it? So we've highlighted that particular point in this particular uh, area as well. Okay, folks, so what am I doing here? Or throughout each and every point, what am I doing? 
I'm just stating some generic points in relation to the reasons for failure of a common organization and I'm relating it using the scenario information of Gadden. Okay, folks, this is how you should structure your answer in the exam. Use generic knowledge that you've learned and use scenario information to relate it to the scenario. That's basically an effective approach that you can adopt when it comes to an APM exam. Okay, folks, so that's all for this particular question. Have you scored the full 25 marks available? Yes, we have. Okay, folks, we scored 10 marks for the first requirement, 8 for the second and 7 for the third as well. Okay, folks, so that's all what I wanted to cover in this particular session. And of course, we have practiced a lot more questions throughout the question marathon itself as well, isn't it? We've learned how to how to tackle the 50 mark questions, a lot more exam techniques, as well as tips and tricks to score the professional marks, as well as various other exam techniques as well, isn't it? So remember all that and adapt to all of those when attending the APM exam itself as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot them within the comment section. I would be happy to answer them. And of course, stay tuned for more informative videos. This is Vishnu Vijay, signing off for now.